Baie dankie, Herman. Ek kan hem nog so'n bykie Afrikaans praat ook, nie. Um, ja, maar jylle is my, maar voorskoon as ek Engels te oorsel, as ek die praatje moet gee, want die technische termen sikkel so'n bykie in Afrikaans. Um, it's a great pleasure for me to be here. I have to say that uh, the, the foundation in engineering that I uh, got here at Stellenbosch is unparalleled, I think, in the world. Uh, I left here to do my master's degree at uh, California Institute of Technology, which is uh, at that time was one of the top engineering schools. It's now, for those of you who keep track of these things, it's ranked the number one w university in the world. Uh, and I'll say a few words about that in just a second. I have to brag. I'm, a, I'm an American. What can I say? I have to brag. <laughs> so, uh, but I can tell you when I got to uh, Caltech, I, you know, I started my master's degree and I took a, uh, a class that was offered as a first year graduate uh, degree in telecommunications. And after about two weeks, I realized this is the stuff that I did in my third year here in Stellenbosch. So I went to the guy and said, I, sorry, I don't want to uh, uh, you know, offend you, but I've, I know all this stuff, so I'm going to drop the class and take something else. And he said, where did you do your undergraduate work? And I said, in Stellenbosch. And he said, of course. If you told me that, I would have told you not to bother taking the class. So, <laughs> so uh, at least he knew about Stellenbosch, so it's a good thing. So. Uh, Thank you for the opportunity to speak here today. I'm going to try and tell you a little bit about the things we're doing at JPL, and I promise you I'll, fi I'll finish with the, uh, the story of curiosity. But first, uh, I hope you guys can see this. That, uh, Stellenbosch, uh, I mean, we are um, at JPL, we are extremely lucky. We are part of both a university. I'm actually an employee and, uh, of the uni uh, university called California Institute of Technology, or Caltech for short. And as I said, uh, we were ranked number one in the world the last time, in case you didn't hear it the first time. Um, <laughs> it's a very small university. It's about 1,500 students total, uh, about half and a half undergraduate and uh, graduate students. And then you have this lab, which is uh, officially called the division Back there, we don't call uh, things faculties like you do here. So we have a division of engineering. And then we have the division called the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, which is 5,000 people, much larger than the rest of the university combined. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, we do a, a lot of work with uh, space agencies across the world. But of course, our um, parent organization in the US government is NASA. Now. The Jet Propulsion Lab actually started in October of 1936. Uh, and what happened was we had a bunch of students on the campus in uh, aeronautics engineering trying to figure out how to make rockets, make things go boom. And unfortunately, they did one day and blew up a shed on the, on the campus where they were mixing this kind of stuff. And I'm sure Stellenbosch has a good uh, number of lawyers, too. And the lawyers immediately banned them from the campus. Um, and, that, and told them to go out there in the, what's called the Arroyo, way away from uh, where, the, uh, where there are people. And there are the first five employees of the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in o October of 1936. The rocket, by the way, that they were launching is just behind the sandbags there. So uh, you can see not too safety conscious and all that kind of stuff. Nowadays, we stand a little bit further away when we light the fuse. Uh, they were students of Professor von Karman, the gentleman on your right, a, um, an immigrant from Hungary that came to the United States and uh, was a professor of aeronautical engineering at um, Caltech for, num for many years. And he's uh, generally the, the uh, father of uh, engineering, uh, at least uh, rocket propulsion engineering uh, in the West Coast, at least. JPL is known for... Uh, our planetary exploration, but uh, we actually do an enormous amount of uh, work with Earth observation as well. So I put in a couple of slides for you here. Right now, we're operating 24 spacecraft. Uh, one of them has, I think, now officially left our solar system. It was launched in 1977 when I was still a student here at uh, Stellenbosch. It's called the Voyager spacecraft, and it actually went through what is called the termination shock of our uh, sun and is now in the interstellar wind. Um, and you can see the rest of them on the slide here. The, the newest uh, member of the family is a small spacecraft we launched in June of this year. It's in a, uh, an X-ray telescope. 
an astrophysics mission. So we do work in earth science, uh, planetary exploration, and astrophysics at JPL. Just a little bit about the earth science quickly before we jump into planetary exploration. Um, in, in earth science, we are uh, one of the places in the United States that have the strongest uh, measurement program for global change type measurements. And in particular, we focus on uh, the water cycle, as you can see here. Of course, the water cycle, if you have good measurements and you can tie those measurements with good models, then hopefully we can do a good job in the end of managing these resources on Earth. So I'll give you two examples of the kinds of measurements we're making. The first one is uh, we've been, since the early 1990s, we've been measuring ocean level, sea level rise. Uh, those satellites that you may have heard of, El Nino and La Nina and those kinds of things, those are radar satellites that measure the height of the ocean, the so-called dynamic topography of the ocean, to an accuracy of about four centimeters. And with that, we can actually tell how the, the uh, sea level has been rising, as you can see there, the graph, over, the, over time. Uh, in the early 2000s, we launched a, a mission called GRACE, uh, Gravity and Climate Recovery Experiment. And it consists of two spacecraft flying around the Earth, and we're tracking the distance between the uh, two spacecraft to one micron as we're flying around the Earth. And so if you have an area that's a little bit more mass, the gravitational pull in that area would be a little bit stronger, and the front spacecraft would speed up a little bit compared to the back one. And then when, you, when the back one arrives there, it'll speed up relative to the other one. And so by tracking this distance very, very carefully, we can actually make a map of the gravitational potential of the Earth. And, um, we can make measurements like you see there in the bottom of Greenland, showing that in fact Greenland is getting lighter. And the only way that Greenland can get lighter is if the, if the uh, ice is melting. So we're actually weighing the Earth and portions of the Earth continuously as we're flying with these two spacecraft around the Earth. By the way, we're di we did this recently at the moon too. We, uh, it's called Grail in case you want to look it up. So, but putting these two things together, you know, Many times you have to make more than one measurement in order to unravel the, two, the true story. Here's an example of that same ocean level rise uh, graph. And you notice in 2010, early 2010, the graph turned down. The ocean was actually getting emptier. And of course, the anti-global warming and anti-sea level rise people were just waiting for that. They said, aha, see, you guys have been telling us this junk for a long time. And there it is. It's just a natural cycle, and we're going to go back to uh, the normal ocean level. Well, if you just have an ocean le uh, and sea level rise chart, you can't tell the difference. See? There are two ways the ocean level can rise. One is the, the ocean can get warmer, and the water would expand. And the second, of course, is you can add water to it. Well, if you add water to it, it'll get heavier. And if you just warm it up, it won't. So if we can measure the gravitational potential, in, in essence, weigh the ocean, we can tell whether there's water added to it or not. Well, so in 2010, we looked at the map of um, the gravity potential of the Earth, measured by Grace, and you can tell where the water went. It went from the oceans onto the land. There were big floods in Australia. Uh, the Amazon basin, you can see, added additional water to it, about 150 millimeters total uh, water over a large area. And that's how you can tell where the water went. Since then, you will notice that graph turned up again, and the gravitational potential went down in those areas again. In fact, yeah, at about the same time, there were floods in Namibia. Uh, I remember many of my friends being a dry country. Water was quite a novelty, so they would send me lots and lots of pictures of all the flooding in Namibia. You could actually tell that the gravitational potential in this part of the world actually went up as well. So uh, that's the kind of things we're doing in earth science. So, but let me take you now on a journey of uh, exploration of our solar system and beyond. So I'll start with this picture, which is about the size of a postage stamp if you go outside and you hold up a postage stamp against the sky. It's called the Hubble Deep Field, and it was measured, uh, obviously, with the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, but the interesting thing is you notice that these are not just pinpoint um, objects in the, in the image here. There are blobs, some of them green, uh, yellow, and some of them bluish, and uh, two little blobs together in this area here. All of those are galaxies. So when you look up in the sky, and what you perceive with your eyes to be dots often could be a, a galaxy like that that in itself 
contains about a billion stars or so. So if you ask me how many stars there are in the universe, uh, the best guess is the answer is somewhere between 10 to the 18 to 10 to 21 stars out there. And of course, that's a lot of real estate to study. <laughs> Every once in a while, the, uh, the galaxies collide, like you see here. And in fact, our galaxy is on a collision course with Andromeda, our nearest neighbor. But I wouldn't go run out and commit suicide. You don't have to worry. That'll take a long time before <laughs> that actually happens. But I think it'll be spectacular to watch if we could from a distance, from a safe distance. <laughs> So let's talk about our own galaxy. Unfortunately, I don't have a picture for you because we couldn't get far enough away yet in order to be able to take that picture. Uh, as was pointed out to a, a dad, we have an open house at JPL every, uh, every year. And we can't really advertise because we cannot uh, handle the crowds. But 40,000 people show up anyway. And we had this particular picture up there for people to take uh, photographs in front of it. And uh, there was a dad with two little kids. One was about six years old, one was about 10. And as, as they walked up to take their picture, the, the middle one was asking the dad, Dad, do you think this is our galaxy? And he said, yeah, I think so. And the little one said, get real, Dad. How would they have been able to take that picture? So <laughs> I offered to hire him right there. But <laughs> so uh, you can see here, this is a spiral galaxy just like ours. Ours is a spiral galaxy, too. And, uh, this is how big our galaxy is. If you were to travel at the speed of light, it'll take you about 100,000 years to get across our galaxy. To put things in perspective for you, if you were to shrink our entire um, solar system to the size of about your, um, I think it's about the two rand, about a US quarter, which is about your two rand coin, uh, our galaxy would be the size of the United States. So it's, a, it's an enormous, uh, which is about uh, 5,000 kilometers across, if I remember correctly. So our galaxy is a vast place, about a billion or so stars in it. Uh, we are way, to, way on the outskirts, which is a good thing, because there's a black hole in the middle that uh, would eventually capture some stuff. So we're relatively safe for now. It's not always the best thing to be in the, in the bright lights of the city. Um, the, our galaxy is a beautiful and violent place at the same time. Here is a, a beautiful nebula called the Butterfly Nebula. It is um, the hottest star in our galaxy. It's about 250,000 degrees Celsius in, in that uh, star. To, for comparison, our sun is about 6,000. So much, much, much hotter than our sun. And it blows this, these. Uh, this interstellar dust away in those beautiful wings of the butterfly. And even at the edge of those wings where they turn reddish up there, uh, they move at a speed of about 2 million kilometers per hour. So that's, uh, you know, there are, I think that'll blow your hair off a little bit if you get too close. Here is a beautiful crab nebula. At its center is a pulsar. A pulsar is a neutron star. It's about the mass of our sun, or close to the mass of our sun, but it's only 30 kilometers in diameter. And so it's an enormously massive object. And it spins at 33 times per second. And of course, sends out radio signals. It, uh, pulsar, pulsars are so reliable, you can actually use them as timing um, references. And we actually do that. So let's move a little closer. One of the things we're trying to do is to find out how unique our solar system is. So let me give you an idea of how difficult it would be in order to take a picture of a planet like ours. That, of course, would be the ultimate for us if we could take a photograph. But here is a picture of Jupiter. Jupiter, you can fit 300 times the Earth inside Jupiter. That's how big it is. This was taken by the Hubble Space Telescope, which is a 2.4 meter, 2.4 meter, excuse me. I'm now in South Africa. 2.4 meters in diameter. It's the largest telescope that we have access to today. Took this picture of Jupiter, and you see the Earth in the bottom there. That telescope will take a picture that looks like this of the Earth, uh, if it's at the, at the distance of Jupiter. OK, so it's not too bad. It looks a little fuzzy, but you can at least figure out there are clouds. There's blue stuff, which is more likely water. And then there may be some things that look like uh, continents on it. So, 
to first order, this would be a good enough picture for us to tell what's going on if we could take a picture like this of a, of a planet. So let's try and put this planet around the nearest star to us, which is 4.1 light years away. Pretty close, by the way, in, in astronomical units. So, so how big a telescope will I need? Well, the mirror will have to fill, be that big. Instead of 2,4 meters, it will be almost fill false bay. And if I build this telescope to look the same as the Hubble Space Telescope, the same dimensions relative to the mirror and so on, this is how big the telescope would be. It'll go from Brodarsdorp to Wooster. <laughs> so uh, I think you will agree with me, it'll be a little difficult to launch something like this into space. So at this point, you might be tempted to say, let's, uh, it's too, too difficult to find planets around other stars. But we don't give up easily. So we figure out a different way. And that is, if a planet revolves around the star, and it comes in between us and the star as that one is about to come, you will block out a little bit of the light from the star. So the star would go dimmer for a little bit and then come back bright again. This happened uh, with Venus and our sun not too long ago, by the way. Uh, so by, telling, by measuring how deep that dip is, we can know how big the planet is. Because obviously, the bigger the planet, the more light it blocks out. Okay? And by measuring the time between those dips, we know how long it takes the thing to go around the sun. So we can learn an awful lot about a planet by just looking at things like this. We don't have to actually physically uh, be able to see that planet. So this is an indirect measurement. So we built ourselves a telescope in order to do this. Uh, it's called the Kepler telescope. You can see the size here. It's uh, about half the size of the Hubble Space Telescope, by the way. So it's small. And, but its job is not to make high resolution pictures. Its job is to measure exactly the intensity of the light from a star and then look for those dips. Now, since we don't know when those dips happen, we will have to look at those stars all the time. So we launched this in 2009. This is what its focal plane looks like. It's probably the most expensive 100 megapixel camera ever built, about $500 million for this thing. Uh, but it's 100 megapixels. And so we take those 100 megapixels and we put them on the sky uh, since uh, roughly uh, the February of 2009. And they've been staring at this particular portion of the sky for every second since then. And uh, there are 150,000 stars that we are tracking. There are more stars in the field of view than 150,000. But we're tracking 150,000 of them specifically <coughs> to see if they have these little dips in them. And almost all of them have shown us dips so far. Here I just showed a bunch of them. It shows the relative size of uh, planets. And you notice many of them have the light blue dots, which are Earth-sized planets. Now, to give you an idea how hard this is to make that measurement, an Earth-sized planet at this distance away, which is about uh, roughly 1,000 to uh, 2,000 or so light years, a, an Earth-sized planet gives a dip that only changes the brightness one out of 20 million. So if you have 20 million photons and one of them is missing, you should be able to measure that. And this is what this, um, this telescope does every second of the day for as long as we can get money, I guess, is the, is the bottom line. <laughs> so, so what that ta taught us, by the way, is if you take the statistics, oh, I should have said, Back to the slide, sorry. Um, we have found about 3,000 planets so far in this field of view, uh, various different sizes. If you take the statistics into account that the orbits can be random in orientation, all those kinds of things, you can say with reasonable certainty that if you look up at the night sky and you see a star, there is at least one planet around that star. Now, the planets we have found so far, the planetary systems, I should say, are quite different than our solar system. You know, we have the small terrestrial planets inside, and then we have the, giant ga the gas giants further out that uh, protect us, in fact, uh, from comets and things like that. Many of the, of the solar systems we found are very different. Some of them have a Jupiter-sized planet running around its star in every four days. So imagine you can have one season every day in a, on a planet like that. On the other hand, that planet's a little too warm for your summer vacation. It's a couple of thousand degrees, so you wouldn't be able to live there. 
So we found a lot of interesting things. But uh, let's look a little bit closer to our own uh, sun. And we'll start at Saturn because my, the rest of the talk will be about finding signs of life elsewhere, elsewhere in our uh, solar system. So we start with Saturn. Saturn is probably the most beautiful planet to me, at least, in our solar system, with the beautiful rings around it. And in 2004, we arrived there with a spacecraft called Cassini, and we had to fly it right through the gap in those uh, rings in order to capture it in orbit around Saturn. And we did that. Fortunately, it worked fine. We were studying at the time, our main focus was to study a moon of, of Saturn called Titan. Titan has an atmosphere made of methane, and it uh, turns out with uh, some of our radar instruments, we've taken pictures of large lakes on Titan, and they are filled with hydrocarbons, which is another way for pet petrol. Imagine an entire moon with lakes of petrol on it. Wouldn't that be nice to be able to get that petrol here? The only problem is it takes you seven years to get out there and then seven years to come back. So it's, a, it's not a, a very economical thing, although people used to joke that uh, when Dick Cheney was the vice president of the United States, his company Halliburton would get the contract to go get the gas. <laughs> so anyway, it turns out we, we were studying Titan, but uh, another beautiful picture of the rings. I can't help to show it. But, just fortuitously, we took pictures of this particular moon, not fortuitously. We were also interested in other things in, the, uh, in between times when we weren't at, um, at Titan. And here you see some interesting, let me see, where is that thing over here? See some interesting linear stripes here, which uh, not uh, too imaginatively were called tiger stripes. Um, and uh, those things intrigued us because it's different than the rest of the, of the planet. And you notice there are, oops, there are big craters, craters up here and nothing really down here, which is an indication that this surface somehow reconstitutes itself every once in a while down in the bottom, because it's unlikely that you would get uh, craters only in one area. Anyway, when we flew past it once and looked back when the sun was behind it, we noticed that. There are those uh, jets of something coming out of the bottom of this moon of uh, Saturn. So we asked our uh, navigators, which are extraordinary people, to figure out a way for us to fly the Cassini spacecraft right through those jets to see what they're made of. And so they, they almost overachieved. They took us only 25 kilometers above the surface of that moon. And uh, we went right through those plumes, and they are actually water. Those are plumes of water spewing out of that thing 100 kilometers high. So, this thing has a lot of liquid water on it, and it is, uh, of course, it, it, it uh, is kept this warm by the tidal friction from the pull of Saturn. Saturn, by the way, has 60 moons, uh, and this is only one of the more interesting ones. Of it. So that's an area that we would desperately like to go back to someday. Um, as I said, the journey takes seven years, and it takes a, a number of years in, in order to develop it, not to mention the, the many, many years it gets to get approval to get the money. So it wouldn't be very soon, but this is an area that we would definitely like to go back to and look for potential signs of past life. Another shot of the, of the geysers as we went away from it. <coughs> Moving a little closer is Jupiter. Now Jupiter is, as I said before, it's about 300 Earths can fit inside Jupiter. In fact, you see that uh, red spot, the famous Jupiter red spot here. That is about three times the diameter of the Earth. It's a storm with winds about 40 to 50,000 kilometers an hour. And it's been raging for more than 100 years. In fact, there's some indication that it was observed 300 years ago. So uh, if you, next time when there's a storm coming through, a front coming through here and it rains and blows wind a little bit, just remember, it can happen for a couple of hundred years. So <laughs> count yourself lucky that it's only a couple of days before it stops again. But Jupiter has a very interesting moon also. This moon is called Europa. And you notice, again, Europa has basically just one crater on it in this picture. So it's an indication that the surface renews itself and reconstitutes itself over time. Uh, it turns out this entire moon is covered by an ice crust. But measurements of the magnetic field and so on around this moon uh, indicates that it must have a liquid, salty ocean, a global ocean underneath that uh, ice crust. And so. One of the missions we're working on now, since it's my job to, start to think about what kind of fun stuff we can try and get money for in the future, is to go back here 
In fact, that'll probably want to be the one of the first places we go back to, uh, and try to figure out if there is indeed a liquid ocean, and if possible, even get to that ocean and see if there's life in the ocean. That would be an interesting problem because you will have to land somewhere and either drill or melt your way through the ice. And the estimates are the ice is somewhere between 20 and 100 kilometers thick. <laughs> but uh, it would be an interesting problem. We will use radar instruments, which can see through the ice, to see if there is, in fact, a liquid ocean underneath. So stay tuned. By the way, one of the things that we're talking about, Herman, is uh, to maybe take uh, something like a 12 or 15 uh, uh, mi microsatellites with us and just drop them off. So get your satellite ready. Who knows? Maybe you, you can hitch a ride over there. <laughs> get, put Stellenbosch on the map over there again. Okay, so let's talk about Mars. Why are we so interested to, in Mars? And, uh, but first, tell, let me tell you about all the, the interesting uh, things that Mars and the Earth have in common. Here you see a relative uh, uh, sizes of Mars. Mars has about one quarter the gravitational pull of the Earth. Uh, and so if you go there, you would weigh one quarter of what you're weighing now. But unfortunately, it's not like a diet where you, that stays with you. When you come back, you'll be heavy again. Uh, but if you put all the land masses of the Earth together, it's about the same surface area as that of Mars. You see Mars has a polar cap in the south there, just like the Earth has polar caps. Mars has canyons, just like the Earth. I was telling the Namibians the other day, uh, I had to put the Grand Canyon on there because, after all, it is the biggest canyon in the world, even though it's in the United States. Even though the Fish River Canyon is the second biggest one, maybe I'll put another little inset there next time. The, the Grand Canyon is 800 kilometers long, and it's the deepest end. It's about 1.6 kilometers. My brother-in-law and I once walked down all the way to the bottom and back up, and I, I'm sure he can tell you that it's deep. <laughs> uh, on the other hand, you have Valles Marineris on Mars, 4,000 kilometers long, not just 800, and its deepest point is seven kilometers deep. So at some point in time, a massive amount of liquid flowed on Mars and carved a tremendously big canyon on it. Mars has volcanoes just like the Earth. This one, I, I guess uh, it's ex exam time here, but I won't ask you which one is Mars and which one's the Earth. It's a little too easy with the trees in it. Uh, the volcano on the right is on Mars, Olympus Mons. It's three times as high as Mount Everest. So, but it, there are very many similarities between the Earth and Mars. Mars has now is mostly desert like the Earth. And here is one that I always ask my students if they can figure out which one is the Earth and which one is Mars. And uh, those of you who have very sharp eyes can, can see that I'm cheating in this one. Because in the upper left corner of the right hand one, there's a van parked there. And that's how I can remember which one is which. The one on the right is the Atacama Desert in northern Chile. It's the driest place on Earth. And the one on the left is uh, on Mars. Looks very similar. In fact, I, I always tell people one of the reasons I like Mars so much is it looks just like the, the Namib Desert to me. Beautiful sand dunes on Mars. This is a camera on the spacecraft called the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. And it has about a 27 centimeter resolution. You can see the beautiful uh, dune on Mars. Mars has, somebody was asking me earlier today, is there wind on Mars? Yes, wind, there are winds on Mars. There are um, dust devils on Mars. These tracks are the tracks of dust devils as they blow across the surface on Mars. They blow the local dust off a little bit, and you can see the difference in color there. By the way, when we landed Curiosity, we did the same thing. We blew up a little bit of dust, much, much less than this. But uh, you can see that the color is different in the area where we landed. It has, more importantly for us in the scientific quest, it has layered terrain. On Earth, layered terrain is, uh, uh, the, the rocks are deposited by water. Indicates that there must have been water on Mars at one time. Also, if you're a fossil hunter on Earth, you don't go to a place with, filled with granite because probably all signs have been uh, burned away. You go to sedimentary rocks, layered terrain like this. 
So that's why we're quite so interested in these things. So how long will it take you to get to Mars? Mars uh, is about 100 million, uh, million miles, so 160 million kilometers away. Uh, you travel much further than that, by the way. You travel about 300 million uh, miles, close to 500 million kilometers if you go to Mars. So if you were to take uh, Lewis and Clark with two American explorers, say Stanley and Livingston, uh, the way that they were traveling through Africa would take them 40,000 years to get to Mars. Uh, by the way, that's also the same number of years it'll take Voyager to get to our halfway to the nearest star from us, by the way. Uh, Columbus, um, Vasco da Gama, one of those guys would have taken 10,000 years with their sail ships to get there. And my boss drives this little sports car in the bottom and he drives like a maniac. And if he drives like that, uh, It'll take him 175 years to get there, assuming he can find gas somewhere along the way. <laughs> this is a family portrait of the rovers only that we've sent to Mars. Uh, Mars is very, very difficult to land on. Only 30% of all attempts to land on Mars have been successful so far. And these are the three rovers, or three uh, classes of rovers we were successful landing on Mars. The one on the Let's see, on your right is what's called Sojourner. The, mis the mission was called Pathfinder. It's about the size of a shoebox when you buy your shoes. Uh, its only job was to see if we can use airbags to land on Mars. Uh, and of course, it was successful. It landed and it ro roved around. I think it drove about 180 meters or something like that in its life. And then it passed away. It's still some, somewhere on Mars. 2004, we sent, oops, I keep trying, pushing the wrong button. 2004, we sent two of these. Now, you notice this one has these black uh, fins up there, uh, or wings. Those are the solar panels. So in 2000, early 2004, we landed two of those on Mars. And one of them, by the way, is still operating. They were supposed to uh, last 90 days. We thought the uh, solar panels would cover up with dust, and it would be the end of it. Uh, one of them has worked for more than 8,000 days now, which is uh, always my students give me a hard time about JPL overcharging and overdesigning for something that was supposed to last 90 days and now it's still going after 8,000. And here is the one we uh, sent this time. So you can see it's quite big. It's about the size of a Mini Cooper car. It weighs uh, 1,000 kilograms. On the surface of Mars, it weighs 250. But um, when we left, it, left here, it, uh, it was... Uh, it's 1,000 kilograms. It has a nuclear reactor in the back, right there. But that nuclear reactor only generates 110 watts. We're operating this entire uh, rover on 110 watts of power only. You notice the heat pipes there. The nuclear power source, of, of course, generates heat. We capture that heat in those pipes, and we pipe the heat inside the body of the rover to keep the electronics warm. <coughs> Much bigger wheels, a mast with cameras on it, and an arm with all kinds of instruments on it, including a drill with which we can drill holes. The drill can actually change its bits by itself. And it drills holes, and we pick up the, uh, the, the dust and put it on the back of the rover. And I'll show you some uh, places in a little while. <coughs> Excuse me. So where have all the landers gone before? Um, today, by the way is the anniversary of landing that one on Mars. Viking 2 landed on 3rd of September 1976 on Mars. So we sent Viking 1 and Viking 2. Viking 1 landed a, about a, a couple of weeks earlier. So those two were there in 1976. Their job was to, to have an experiment to see if they could find signs of life in <laughs> 1976. They did their experiment and determined that there was no life on Mars. And lots of controversies from between now, then and now of whether that experiment was actually the right experiment to do. So in order to prove that it was the wrong experiment, a people a few years ago repeated that same, exact same experiment with exact same technology in the Atacama Desert where we know there's life and found no life. So, uh, okay. so every once in a while your experiment is flawed. <laughs> so, but fortunately by a, now, a long time ago, those guys got their PhDs and they're out of the university. They're OK. Um, like I said, 1997, we landed Pathfinder here. 2004, we landed Opportunity and Spirit uh, in January, uh, sort of a couple 
weeks apart. And Phoenix, we landed in 2007 up here. Uh, Phoenix is a stationary lander. It's, uh, was, it only operated for a couple of months. And um, after the, the winter, we uh, tried to take pictures of it, and it was gone. And some people uh, are arguing that the Martians took it away. <laughs> but we, I don't think so. I think it's just covered. So. so this is what we did in 2004. We sent this little guy there. You can see a relative size to people there. They landed on Mars. Uh, I always put this picture in there. This is Victoria Crater on Mars. There are some people who don't believe that we actually went to Mars. They think we're, this is all just a hoax. And JPL is smart enough to spend billions of dollars and nobody will catch us and we're just landing stuff in the Mojave Desert outside. <laughs> this is actually a crater on Mars. And if you zoom in uh, to this crater, you can actually see one of those little rovers standing there. There's the rover. And there is the shadow of its mast on the ground. And there are little tracks that it drove up to this particular place. So we are actually on Mars. And this thing actually went there. This is the picture it took of the Earth. So this is the first picture ever of the Earth from another planet. Uh, you know, when I look at this, I, I kind of have to wonder what that rover must be thinking. Uh, what did I do for them to send me this far away? <laughs> Here is a little time lapse of a series of photographs taken by one of those rovers. And you notice the winds blowing by. Uh, let's see. There's a little wind uh, dust devil coming by. It turns out the reason we thought that 90 days we would stop working, as I said, we thought the, the solar panels would be covered up by dust and we wouldn't get solar power anymore. But these guys are our friends. They come by very reliably all the time. And they blow the dust off of that thing again. And so that, that uh, gives us the power. You can actually see in the data how the power is dropping and dropping. And then suddenly it shoots back up as the wind goes by. So fortunately, they're not strong enough to flip them over. But so they were sent there to find signs, conclusive evidence that there were water on Mars. You know, people can argue a lot about whether was actually water that carved the canyons, or maybe the canyon just formed by itself, all that kind of stuff. So we went there to look for specific minerals that form in water on Earth. One of them is hematite. It's a type of iron oxide. And those little balls that you see lying there, they were called blueberries, uh, jokingly. These are hematite crystals. So we found the hematite on, on the surface of Mars. So we now. We knew then at that time we had now conclusive evidence that there are minerals on Mars that form in water. We have sort of circumstantial evidence with the canyons and all those kinds of things that there, there must have been a lot of water on Mars at some point in time. And sort of the icing on the cake is this series of photographs taken by the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter over a Martian summer. And you see those streaks forming sort of out of the side of this uh, formation here. And then it flows out for a while. And then as the end of, at the end of the summer, it disappears again. This is taken, most people agree now, that this must be briny water that's actually flowing out of, the, um, out of the side of that formation. So we believe, and Phoenix actually showed that when it, would, it dug a little trench, that there's water ice very close to the surface on Mars everywhere. In fact, with the radar sounder we have flying on a European spacecraft, and, an, and we have two, one on a European spacecraft and one on, a, on an American spacecraft, we have found buried um, ice deposits like glaciers on Mars. So there is a lot of water even today on Mars, and sometimes it might even be in liquid form like this. So as a result, we decided to send this uh, rover to Mars. Uh, as I said, it's about the size of a Mini Cooper. And you notice we painted it white. We did not paint it red like a Ferrari because we're not driving that fast on, on the surface of Mars. Not with 110 watts, you won't. But you can see also by the size of the people next to it that it's much, much bigger than the rovers we sent before. It's a roving chemical laboratory. There are 10 very, very sophisticated instruments on this thing. Uh, there are ovens and laser um, spectrometers and things like that inside of that body of the rover itself. This is how big it is. It was before we launched it. Uh, 
you can see the, uh, the one gentleman is holding, by the way, they are full-sized Americans. Uh, the one guy is holding his, uh, his hand up to the heat shield that was supposed to protect us as we were going through the atmosphere on Mars. Uh, that heat shield is four meters in diameter, close to four meters in diameter. Um, the ring up at the top is the cruise stage. That's the satellite that took us from the Earth after we escaped the gravitational well of the Earth. That thing took us to Mars. And just before we got to the atmosphere of Mars, we jettisoned it. It, it also entered the atmosphere and uh, you know, is somewhere on Mars. Who knows uh, where? Uh, and this conical shape thing then went into the atmosphere of Mars. Um, to land on Mars is very, very difficult. We travel at 21,000 kilometers an hour by the time we get to Mars, at the top of the Martian atmosphere. And this conical shaped thing weighed 3,000 kilograms. So uh, if you take 20, 21,000 kilometers an hour, 3,000 kilograms, and calculate the kinetic energy, that's about the same as 18,000 Formula One cars driving at top speed. That's what we enter the atmosphere of Mars with. And we're supposed to stop gently on the surface in seven minutes. Uh, and if that's not enough, we have to land in a very specific place. We don't, we're not just going anywhere on Mars. We want to go to a very specific place because we want to study a specific type of terrain, which means we have to have very, very accurate navigation to get there. To put it in context for you, it'll be a little bit like asking any else to tee off here in Cape Town and hit a golf ball into the cup in St. Andrews in Scotland. He can't bounce and all that kind of stuff. And uh, to make Ernie's life a little more difficult, he doesn't know what the weather is like in Scotland when he tees off here. And if that's not enough, we make it even a little bit more difficult for him. The cup is moving at 100,000 kilometers an hour. And then he has to put it in there. So that's what we are trying to do. So uh, when I was here last time, I showed some people a video. If you want to go watch it on, uh, on YouTube, uh, search for seven minutes of terror. And uh, it is, explains a little bit uh, how we are doing it. And it starts off by the guy, guy saying, when people look at it, they think we're crazy. And sometimes when we look at it, we think we're crazy. We thought we were crazy right up to the end, I can tell you that. But I'll show you now a sequence of how we actually did this on Mars. So fasten your seat belts. Here we go. So we arrive at Mars, the 5th of August our time, 6th of August your time, entering the atmosphere 21,000 kilometers an hour. We heated up the, the heat shield to about 1,600 degrees Celsius. As we were going, by the time we slowed down to about 1,000 miles, 1,600 kilometers an hour, we opened this parachute. That's about 21 meters in diameter. And this parachute had about 9 Gs of force on it when we opened it up. We dropped the, the heat shield at that point. We don't need it anymore. In fact, we need the radar to be able to see the ground. This thing slowed us down to about 300 kilometers an hour. But that's about it, the best it can do. And then we dropped this little jetpack out of it with the rockets to slow us down further. And so this took us down all the way to the surface. But we couldn't just land that thing on the surface. We'd blow dust everywhere and rocks everywhere. So we came to about 20 meters above the surface, and then we lowered the rover on cables like that. We call it the sky crane. The, the cables are seven meters long. And hovered like this, and slowly went down onto the surface of Mars. We'll get there eventually. That's, the, it felt a lot longer than this, I can tell you, when I was sitting in JPL that, that evening listening to this. So, by the time we got on the surface, and the way we knew we were on the surface, we could tell by the pull by, the, by those rockets, the thrust of the rockets changing because some of the weight was taken off of it. We waited four seconds after we thought we had that indication, and then we cut the cables and flew the jetpack away. We didn't care where it went as long as it didn't <laughs> fall on the thing. <laughs> so, so that's how we landed on, on Mars. It was, uh, <laughs> so, and to prove it to people that we actually 
landed there. We had two spacecraft that we coordinated their orbits so that they would be right overhead as we were entering the atmosphere and going down on the surface. By the way, it takes seven minutes for us to land. It takes the signal 14 minutes to get from Mars. So I was telling, I was hosting people in an auditorium about this size, a little bit bigger at JPL that night. And I, at 14 minutes before we got the signal that we actually landed, I told them, Curiosity is actually on the surface as we speak. We just don't know what happened. We're going to find out in the next 14 minutes. The room went completely silent at that point in time. But you can see here, this is a picture taken by that Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, the same uh, camera that took the picture of the, um, of the rover on the surface. Beautiful shot of the, of the uh, parachute and the rover hanging in the bottom of the parachute as we were going in for the landing. Uh, here is the heat shield as it was dropping away from the, the lander itself. Uh, we had cameras in the bottom, and you go to the JPL website, which I will show you the URL at the end. You can actually see the video of this thing dropping away uh, onto the surface. And keep in mind that dark area there. I will show you some of those in the, in the surface pictures in a little set while. So this is where everything ended up. You can see the heat shield is on your bottom right there. The parachute in the back shell is over here on the left. That's about uh, sort of three quarters of a kilometer uh, away from Curiosity, if I remember correctly. And the sky crane landed way on the other side there. Um, as I said, we didn't care where it went as long as it didn't fall on the rover. Uh, Curiosity is safe and sound. This is what it looks like on Mars. Now you can see why I say it, it reminds me of Namibia where I grew up. Uh, those lighter spots, by the way, are the holes that was blown by the rockets when we came down, the two holes that you see there. And there is proof that we are actually on the surface of Mars. There's the wheel of the rover standing right there, and thank God it's upside, uh, the right side up on Mars. Um, beautiful landscape. Uh, the darker area that I showed you in that picture where the heat shield was dropping off is this little area right here. It turns out it's a very, an area of very fine, smooth sand that will undoubtedly go drive over and probably get stuck in it. By the way, the 2004 time, one of those ro rovers got stuck in the sand for a while. And those of you who have gone uh, four-wheeling in Namibia knows that the guys like to drive in the sand there. I got many, many emails from Namibia offering to come drive it out for us. <laughs> When we landed on the surface, we, we hovered at 20 meters, and we made those cables because we were afraid, as I said, of the dust and the rocks and so on that we might blow up as, uh, you know, blow uh, into the air as we were coming down. But as you can see here, the cables are not long enough. There are still a bunch of stuff on top of the rover here. Uh, this, by the way, is the port, one of the ports that we will, when we pick samples up with the, the arm, that port will open and we will put the, material in there, and then it goes into an oven uh, for further analysis with spectrometers and so on. So we are safe and sound on Mars. We uh, took a couple of days to upload the software to tell the rover how to drive around. Uh, the rover, we don't tell the rover exactly where to drive. Drive three meters this way and two meters that way. We tell it drive from here to there, and it figures it out itself where to go. It has stereo cameras on it. it can make a three-dimensional picture, figure out how big rocks are and so on. It has six wheels. It can climb over something about half a meter in size. But if the rocks are too big, it'll drive around it and go wherever it needs to. If the hole is too deep, it'll go away from it. Uh, the only thing it can't figure out is how soft the sand would be, and that would be a problem that we would have to deal with from the Earth. If it gets to an area where it doesn't know what to do, it'll stop and wait for us to call it. Uh, so, and tell it what to do. And then we'll probably tell it to back up for a while and go somewhere else. Uh, here is a little panorama for you of where the rover is. Again, it looks like the Namib Desert or out here in the northwest near the Orange, uh, Orange River up there. And you can see uh, the mountain that we are trying to drive up coming in your view from the right now. That mountain is called Mount Sharp. Um, and it is about six kilometers high. It uh, represents uh, millions of years of Martian history. And we're going to be driving up that uh, mountain and stopping, I'm sure, every five meters or so. <laughs> because we have a big science team, and everybody would want their favorite rock study. 
And uh, <laughs> then we will go up there and analyze the rocks. And uh, as I said, because the bottom rocks are the oldest and the top ones are the youngest, we'll be able to cover millions of years in Martian history to see if life ever existed there. And if so, for how long? Uh, and when did it start and when did it disappear? Hopefully, we are lucky enough to capture all of that in the geologic history of this particular mountain. Oops. So another close-up shot of the area. This is where we are more than likely going to go first, this side of the mountain. A close-up of it. If you can see a little black dot there, that's about the size of the rover. Give you an idea of the mountain that we have to climb up there over time. Now, I'll tell you one thing. Somebody was asking me the other day, now, how are you going to drive up a six-kilometer mountain with this thing with 110 watts? Well, there was an interesting uh, ad that somebody sent me at, in the United States. The Ford Motor Company, shortly after we landed, put out an ad comparing their new V8 Ford truck to this rover. And of course, their first claim was it's a lot cheaper than this one. <laughs> and sure enough, you can buy quite a few Fords for the price of this one. But they go through the whole thing about how great the Ford is. And, but in the end, they admit that the, um, the, the total torque that that V8 engine um, delivers to the wheels is less than the torque to each individual wheel on this particular uh, rover. So that's how we're going to climb up this mountain, slowly and deliberately. You don't want to be the one that says, oops, I drove up the wrong rock this time and we, did, we flipped over. Now, just uh, to wrap up, show you a picture of the wheels for a very good reason. Engineers are people with strange sense of humor. I'm one, so I can say that. Uh, you notice there are holes in the wheel here. And there are three rows of holes like that. We put these kinds of markings on the wheels because we don't have an odometer on the, on the rover. That hel helps us figure out how far we've actually driven. Take pictures of it. You know how big the wheel is, and you count how many times the, that you see that pattern on the surface, and you know how far we've actually driven. Well, these smart Alex put JPL in Morse code on the wheels. That's what it is. <laughs> so as we're driving around on Mars, we're writing JPL, JPL, JPL. <laughs> so, so I, t I t by the way, they didn't tell us what they were until it was far too far along to change anything in it. Uh, I told them that they missed a great opportunity. They should have put NASA in Morse code on the front wheels and JPL on the back wheels. That way we can leave the mark JPL, but if we need money, we can drive backwards for a while and get some more money. <laughs> so. Anyway, so. We have just started driving. We, the first target, the first science target is 400 meters away from where we landed. If you read the press release, you will see it, we expect it to take several weeks. And the reason is, as I said, we have a large science team. And I'm sure at every damn rock we find, they will stop. It'll be like kids every time you drive past, past the gas station, one wants an ice cream. So we'll, we'll have to stop everywhere. It takes us a while to get there. Um, I will leave you with a quote that is one of my favorite quotes. Do not go where the path may lead. Go instead where there is no path and leave a trail. And if you want more information, just look at our website. Every day we put out uh, the, new, the latest pictures. By the way, there's a link on there. If you go on this website, you'll see raw images. All our data are freely available. You can actually click on it now and download the raw images that were sent back. There's a ton of them. I warn you if you want to go do that. There's a lot of pictures, but you can download any of the pictures yourself free. If you use them in a publication or in the media, just credit NASA. It's all on the website. Uh, but by, by uh, NASA policy, all our data are in the public domain. So anyone of you have access to it. Thank you very much for your time. I hope you enjoyed it. <laughs>